Good morning, everyone, um, and you're very welcome to this morning's webinar, which is maximizing your career potential in 2024, with a particular focus on APAs and QFAs. My name is Eva Lavin. Um, my role at LIA is Head of Education. This is a 45 minute webinar and it's delivered in collaboration with 360 Search, who are an industry leading recruitment consultancy firm specializing in recruitment within the financial services industry. And I'm delighted to be joined by two of their recruitment consultants today, Holly Rails and Kate Corcoran. And they'll be bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience to this webinar. So whether you are embarking on your finance career journey, you might be seeking new opportunities, or maybe you're aiming for professional growth, then this webinar is definitely for you. During the webinar, Holly and Kate will be answering questions that they are frequently asked, but they'll also be answering you know, your questions. So if you do have any questions during the webinar to ask either myself, Holly or Kate, you can please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and then we'll take some time at the end to, to answer them. So I'm now gonna hand you over to Holly and Kate, and then I'll be back at the end um, for the Q&A. Amazing. Thank you, Eva. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Amen. us. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to join the LIA again to, I suppose, focus on career potential and career growth within the industry. Um, me and Kate specialise in recruitment across life, pensions, investments, mortgages, um, and we speak with candidates who have maybe the APA or the QFA on a daily basis, supporting them in their career journey. So hopefully we can share a few insights and information and tips today that can help you along the journey as well. I um, suppose we're really conscious that everyone's career journey is quite unique to them, so feel free to pop any specific questions in the chat box or our contact details will be on the last slide. Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to me and Kate directly. So what we're going to cover off on today is we'll initially look at a few industry insights um, so just with regards to what's impacting recruitment within the life pensions and mortgage industry currently. Um, we'll look at and discuss various different career paths and um, where you can grow and how you can progress within the industry and um, how you can focus on professional growth um, and then how you will go about, I suppose, the application process and the interview process and um, some tips around general recruitment. Great, so just to begin with, a few factors that are play and that impact, I suppose, the hiring, not just within our industry, but within, um, but as a whole, I suppose, both positive and negative. Um, so first off is the national employment rate. This is currently sitting, it's basically a full employment, you know, so that just means that the supply of jobs greatly outweighs the demand. Um, this is prevalent across the whole of Ireland, you know, not just in financial services. What is particularly um, prevalent within the financial services industry is the skill shortage. So people who do have the, the QFA and the relevant experience that goes along with that, we're seeing a huge demand um, for those candidates. Um, life and pensions, it is an industry that is it's constantly going through changes with regards to regulation um, and what everyone's been talking about. It's been coming down the line for, for a long time now is pensions auto enrollment, which is looking to take place um, this year. And it's something that we've seen has had a huge impact on the hiring demand within the pensions industry. Um, and then finally, market consolidation. So a lot of you will probably be aware over the last few years, We've had a lot of providers leave the Irish market, so the likes of Ulster Bank and KBC. And we've also seen a lot of kind of mergers and acquisitions happening within the broker and advisory space. Um, so a lot of bigger companies acquiring smaller companies and the impact that that has had, it's just, I suppose, meant that there's a smaller um, pool of employers within this specific industry um, for candidates to choose from. Um, and then a little bit more information that we gathered from um, the use of LinkedIn. So we did a search on LinkedIn using QFA and Qualified Financial Advisor. So anyone who had that within their LinkedIn profile and within Ireland, that produced 16,679 professionals. 
not all of whom are fully QFA qualified and not all of whom still work within the um, financial services industry, but that's the amount of people who had it in their profile. And out of that data set, nearly 10% moved jobs within the last 12 months, which is pretty standard and what we would expect in line with, with this industry. Um, the average amount of time that these individ individuals spend with their employer is 2.9 years. Um, it, it's quite fairly split in terms of gender diversity. And what we did find, find and which wasn't really a surprise for myself and Kate, is that the hiring demand is deemed to be very high for this group of professionals. And LinkedIn based that data off um, the number of recruiters who are reaching out to these individuals in comparison to to other people working in different industries. Um, so it just goes to show that there is a, a large amount of hiring demand and lots of roles um, for individuals within the QFA, with the QFA. And Holly, who do you think are the top employers um, for this industry? Yeah, um, using actually the data from LinkedIn and unsurprisingly, the top employers were the banks. So the likes of AIB, Payment TSB and Bank of Ireland. And then that was followed with the life companies. So Irish Life, New Ireland, Aviva and Zurich. Um, slightly different from the companies that we would recruit for. So for those of us, those of you that don't know 360 Search well, um, the type of companies we would work with closely would be on the life, pensions, investment and mortgage side, mostly brokers or advisory firms. Although we do also recruit with some of the lenders and some of the life companies as well. And how difficult do you feel it is to enter the industry without having a QFA or APA? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd say it's it's a huge positive if you've got that qualification. Joe, you know, I think it's dependent on if you're already in the industry or if you're looking to progress and what type of role you're looking to gain. It, it can vary, you know. So if your goal is to be in a client-facing advisory role, um, the QFA is essential. And that's not a decision that the employer is able to make. Their hands are tied by the central bank and the minimum competency that's required by the central bank. So realistically, if you don't have that QFA qualification, you shouldn't be in a position where you're giving advice directly to a client. So if you are looking to gain an advisory client-facing role, the QFA is absolutely essential. Um, there's probably a little bit more flexibility with regards to the support or administration roles. Um, do you know you're not client facing you're not given that advice so I think so long as you're working towards the qualification um, do you know there's you're not as stuck with regards to the central bank requirement um, say what what our employers do want to see is that you're making headway into improving yourself developing I suppose getting that qualification just shows your commitment um, to the industry and to your own career um, so it's you know, I'd say basically don't delay if you know if it's an industry you want to work in or you want to progress in, don't delay in getting the APA or getting the QFA. And then within the industry, how are you finding the employees you're working at the moment, their hybrid or remote offering? Yeah, this is a question we get asked so much, isn't it? About the hybrid or remote working. Um, and honestly, this varies hugely from employer to employer. Do you know, we might have one job which on paper is the same job but one employer wants you in five days a week in the office the other employer you know you might just be in one day so it does it does vary hugely I'd say as a general um hybrid working is where it, it sits you know so maybe three days in the office two days from home and um, I think especially for more junior candidates when you're starting off you can probably expect that you will be in the office more. So it could be four or five days a week for that initial um, probation or training period to, for you to like learn the ropes. So that's probably what you can expect. Yeah. Um, the next thing we're gonna look into is the career paths within the industry. So these are the different routes that you can go, whether you're going from life company, brokerage, banks, but, Advisory and consultancy, normally when you think of QFA, that's probably the first route people go down, you know, being that client facing role. So the QFA, it is a min minimum competency that you will have to do for this role. If you're put, being put in front of clients, you need to have that backing to show that you've done 
and you have to have that minimum competency. Um, and really a lot of the employers we're working with at the moment, although QFA is a must, RPA and CFP are favorable. So it's definitely, you know, when you get to QFA, if you really want to be top of the game in this um on this route, look in with the LIA, look at, you know, progressing with the RPA, SIA and the CFP. So do that continuous study. Then administration and back office that will range from, you know, whether your sales support, existing business, operations, you could be doing projects. And it just really depends on, you know, where the step in, you know, where you're getting your foot in the door, what route you want to go, even from going, say, being sales support, you can transfer into different areas within the back office or into client facing and that kind of brings into the managerial side. Generally, if you're going to go into a manager role or a team leader role, they want you to have been in the position before. So, you know, if you're leading a sales team, they want someone that's done it in the past, understands targets, understands, you know, where the mind of the sales advisors are and how, you know, to keep them motivated, what, um, you know, way leads are needed, what marketing's needed. On the reverse side with the administration, they'll understand, right, I've done this role this is when I was in, this is what we needed. So generally it would be very unusual if you were in administration to become a sales manager and vice versa. And then compliance, as Holly mentioned before, the central bank is a hugely important part of financial services. It's a hugely regulated industry compliance. If not every company they're outsourcing, if they do not have a compliance department, you know, it's too high risk to not be, you know, having your paperwork right and um, doing your um client meetings right so that's definitely a growing part of the industry and then even within the kind of lines of business in the industry so we would work a lot with individual life and pension so this is very uh personal focus kind of you could be an advisor whether it's you're specializing a product of life and pensions or more goal orientated whether you know your client might be looking for a holiday home in a couple of years or, you know, putting for a college fund. That's the really kind of personal side of financial services. The corporate and employee benefit side is definitely something that's um we've seen a huge growth in, especially in the last two years and with auto enrollment. So the corporate and the group pension side, you know, it's not going to be a choice for employers anymore, whether they have a pensions offering for their employees, it has to be in. And we can see that, um, having an effect on the employers we work with because they want experienced pensions consultants that are there for these employers and they know this is the go-to person when they have new staff to be onboarded um, and then on the employee benefit side people you know salary is just not the standard anymore people want the extras that come with it so whether it's a pension life cover income protection and health so that's kind of incorporating that side whether you're helping you know do the administration work or actually meeting with the clients themselves mortgages you could be either with the broker or a lender we've seen a lot in, in the last couple of years brokers are really the kind of go-to at the moment getting the advice especially when you see the difference with the interest rates and you know it is a difficult process it's much more of a longer client journey than on the life and pension side you know you could be working with someone from six months to two years plus on this journey. So whether you're the first point of contact or you're with them through drawdown, there's a huge opportunity there. And then with wealth management and investments, this is where you're kind of going into the like specialized investment advisor. So the SIA, generally the clients for these, they might be a little more knowledgeable of the industry. It might be a bit more technical. And not just say life and pensions be more well-rounded. Wealth management is more, you know, focused on what's going to make their money work for them. Yeah, fantastic. I think it's like, it's good to know, isn't there, that someone who might have experience in one area of the industry, there's opportunity to move into another area, you know, and a career path isn't, if you're in individual life and pensions, your career path isn't solely within individual life and pensions you know you can kind of meander off into different areas yeah um, and that's why having the full qfa is important so definitely. some cases you might just need you know a regulations and loans done or others but when they see you have everything ticked they know you know you have the 
bit of background knowledge and a bit of information on it. Yeah, it opens the doors. Yeah. And what would you say, I suppose, for someone who's maybe in an administration role at the moment, what opportunities could they look at to kind of either move into a different area or into a different role? It's really like administration is definitely, I'd say, what we see as the get your foot in the door role within financial services. Like if you want to go, a lot of the clients we work with, they'll promote within, especially, you know, if you're going to go into a target driven role, for example, or a client facing role. Mm -hmm. If you know the clients, you know the systems they use, you understand their processes, they'll be happy to develop you into an advisory role. With the likes of auto-enrollment and other regulations coming in, you could sidetrack and go more on the project route and making sure that the company is remaining up to date in all the compliance needs or, you know, with new systems, new technologies are being brought in. So there's really, once you have your foot in the door, it's really up to you where you want to go, but it's making sure that you have, you know, you're making your managers aware or you've done your QFA that they know, okay, they're kind of committed and they want to continue and they want to grow within the industry. Yeah. And then in terms of a financial advisor position, would you say that a large portion of that role is sales? Well, technically, yes. Like anyone in an advisory or consultant position, you are an income generator for the company. So there is some sort of target, but it's in the name. It's, you know, you're not a financial salesperson. You're an advisor, a consultant. It is regulated. You need to be making sure that you know, if you're speaking to someone, they understand and it's very clear why this product is recommended to them. So although you are income generation, it's not, you know, hard selling, it's advisory, it's consultancy. And when you have kind of that natural flair of speaking to someone and understanding and getting the big picture of the full financial health check, rather than, you know, why should they want life cover, let's get that over the line. They could have life cover, but they might not have income protection, or they might not have a pension. It's, you know, that it just comes hand in hand that you're going to hit your target when you understand that's what's required yeah. of you. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting point for some of the people who may be on this webinar. I think a lot of people go through the QFA journey, you know, with the expectation that they're then going to become a financial advisor, you know, which is is definitely not the only option for people. And it's not the option that suits a lot of people. You know, it's important to note that, yes, that is a target driven role and most of the time if you are in a financial advisory position you're going to have um a target on your head and obviously that doesn't work for everyone so yeah. it, it's it's good to kind of see the different career paths within the industry for people once they have that qfa it's not just down the route of financial advice Absolutely. um but then on that note what would you say is the most in-demand role that we're seeing at the moment financial advisory <laughs> at the moment and especially kind of people that maybe at five years QFA is a pretty hot spot at the moment that we're working yeah. on yeah um, and then on the flip side the kind of corporate employee benefits auto enrollment is really driving that and if you can kind of get your foot in the door and you know be that person in two years that is really knowledgeable on that side I think there's a lot of progression opportunities there yeah definitely like the auto enrollment pushing kinds of hiring on the employee benefit side yeah for sure um, and I think it's just a case that kind of consumers currently or over the last few years, they've got, they want to be more involved with yeah, like you know, what's going on in their personal finances. And that as a result, we're, we're seeing it now in the hiring trends, you know, there's a huge demand for experienced and qualified financial advisors. Yeah. Well, so then we just wanted to touch on professional growth. So I suppose this is really important whether you're looking to enter the industry, you know, whether you're looking to get a promotion in your current company, whether you're looking to move into a different role and you're applying elsewhere, or whether you just want to excel in the company and role that you're in at the moment. Like, how can you go about um, gaining professional growth? Um, so a few, a few tips from us. So I think initially kind of setting goals and milestones is really, really important. Um, so figure out if it's a year's time where you want to be. And then that way you can you can start to make actionable, I suppose, ways to actually achieve that. Um, 
you know so where do you want to be in your career what do you want to achieve that could be down to qualifications it could be down to job title it could be something quite personal to yourself and what, what you want to achieve um you know on a personal basis and um, then the pursue of qualifications so as we're talking about the APA and the QFA they're really really important but if you're focusing on an area that you want to get into you know it could be compliance there's different exams that you can do there for compliance and um, in the long run you could really see yourself being in a people management role there's plenty of courses that you can look at to kind of gain more experience and insight into the people management side of things and um, you know if you're involved in like projects or if your role is quite data heavy you might look to do a course with regards to excel do you know so Yes, the APA and the QFA is really, really important um, within this industry. But how else can you um, develop your skills and, and grow? And then you've got the CPD. So that's essential anyway, if you want to maintain the qualification. Um, it's really the best way to kind of, I suppose, develop your understanding of the industry and keep up to date with the changes and what's happening within the industry. Um, and I think actually like being engaged within the CPD, you know, if you're watching a webinar, um, I know all too well that it can be put on in the background and you're not fully paying attention to it. But if you actually pay attention to it and take that into your day-to-day -day job, then before you know it, you're going to be the expert with on your team, you know, and you're the person who's answering queries to other people within your team um, because you're really aware of the changes within the industry, the changes within the products and, um, you know, really just keeping up to date with that. Um, Expanding your network, I'd say that would be really important if you see that you are going to move on from a company in the near future. Um, so that could be through in-person events, um, such as CPD events or other industry events that are happening, actually connecting with people in real life. Um, it could be using the likes of LinkedIn and connecting with people um, virtually, you know, connecting, reaching out, um, seeing the content and the information that people are putting out there kind of staying up to date with what your peers are doing and kind of getting inspired as well. Um, and then there's plenty of other resources, I think, that are out there, especially from, you know, as I know from the LIA perspective, there's so many, like, great webinars and events that they put on from a recruitment perspective. I know Ozone 360, we have a weekly newsletter that goes out. Um, it's really specific to the life and pensions industry. You know, it highlights... Um, upstate industry news and various different opportunities that we're recruiting for um, and other kinds of resources such as salary surveys which you might find really interesting as you continue on um, within your career journey kind of looking for new roles. And how would you say is the best way for someone that does want to move on with their career how do you think it's best to approach the employer about new opportunities yeah I think as a recruiter it's something that we we try to cover off on don't we when we first meet with a candidate you know have you actually approached your current employer is your employer, employer even aware that you're looking for a new opportunity do you know and that's that's the best place to start I suppose how you go about that definitely using your one-to-ones so most companies hopefully you have like a monthly one-to-one, -one, a performance review, some type of check-in or opportunity with your manager where you can say, look, I'm, I'm really focused on professional growth. I really want an opportunity within this company. What is there? What can I work towards? And really opening up that conversation. Um, do you know, and sometimes if you haven't broached that conversation with your manager, they aren't to know, do you know? So I think putting yourself out of your comfort zone and opening up that conversation is the first port of call. Um, if you're in a bigger organisation, there may be opportunities for you to apply internally to different roles, um, do you know, and that's a very obvious indicator that you're looking for for growth and change. Um, and then trying to set yourself apart, I suppose, from colleagues and trying to get recognised by management. So, a great example of this is if there's a project happening, you know, or there's a comment which is available, putting your hand up and making sure that you're in the mix and being considered for things like that is a great way to get recognised in your current, with your current employer. And do you think it's worth someone in our industry being on LinkedIn? 
I think 100% if you're on this webinar and you're interested in professional growth or you're interested in, you know, you're thinking that you're looking for a new role or even if you're not actually, like you definitely should be on LinkedIn. Do you know, LinkedIn isn't all about finding a new job. Um, do you know, I think to be on LinkedIn, to be connected with people, experts within your industry, to be connected with your peers, to see the information that they're sharing, it's a great way to stay up to date with what's going on within the industry. Um, do you know, and then on top of that, it's a great way if you are maybe in a financial advisory role or you're looking to get into a financial advisory role and you want to build your own personal brand, it's a great platform to do that as well, a great professional platform to do it. Um, and then obviously, if if you are looking to, to maybe find new roles or explore what else is out there, LinkedIn has its own jobs board where you can look at, search and apply for jobs. And then also, if you've got a profile there, you're going to be um, available to be found by recruiters, the likes of me, Kate and every other recruiter out there who uses LinkedIn as a tool do you know if you're not on if you don't have a profile on LinkedIn they can't find you and they're not going to be able to approach you about opportunities so yeah I'd say it takes five minutes and um, if you aren't already on LinkedIn definitely do <laughs> and then what are the benefits of dealing with a recruiter um I think first off it's probably even before we talk about dealing with a recruiter, I'd say it's a benefit to find the right recruiter. Yeah. So to find the recruiter who's an expert in the industry that you're that you're looking to find an opportunity, that's probably um the best way to go about it, you know. So we really do specialize in life, pensions, and mortgages. Um, the more specialist your recruiter, the better opportunities they can probably put in front of you. Um, and the benefits to using a recruiter. So First off, you might be in a position where you know you want career growth or opportunity, but you might not know what that is. So there are person there to have that initial conversation with, and maybe guide you through, put options in front of you, discuss what your skill set is and what might be best suited to you. Um, then they will be working with a lot of various employers and a lot of various roles that will be directly related to your experience do you know they can discuss all of those in detail and they probably would have access to roles that might not be getting advertised elsewhere and um, also if like a lot of companies they might release the roles to recruiters first do you know so they're the first you can then be the first to know about a new role that hits the market and um, additionally they can give valuable insights with regards to what's going on like me and Kate chat with candidates day in day out we chat with hiring managers and employers day in day out you know we've got our ear close to the ground as to what's going on within the industry so there's a lot of insights there that we can share and um, that might even come down to you know the likes of um salary brackets and kind of where you sit given your experience um then i suppose i think we like to really like support our our candidates you know so whether that's putting your cv together um, I suppose the application process so for us it's not just sending a CV it's actually then picking up the phone to that hiring manager and really really getting behind you and supporting you and and hopefully getting you an interview do you know which sometimes you might not be able to get on your own just by sending a CV um, interview preparation is something we try to do with all of our candidates as well and then all the way through to the offer stage potentially negotiating an offer so there's so many benefits that we can bring um or that you can gain I suppose by using a recruiter um and it's it's free of charge as well for candidates which people who might not have used a recruiter before might not be familiar with um so yeah plenty of benefits there but that kind of leads nicely then into actually if you are taking the step and you are looking for um an opportunity within the industry whether you're new to the industry or do you have previous experience but want to maybe delve into something a bit different so when applying for a position it's important to do this background work beforehand to put your kind of best self forward and to make sure that you know like you've probably heard this time and again an employer will look at your cv three five seconds at most and decide whether they want to bring you forward for an interview so it's making sure that 
what they see is popping out and it's not, you know, just blending in with all the, you know, 20 plus, 50 plus applications they might have received. Mm -hmm. So first of all, if you are looking at a position, make sure that you are looking into the company and you're looking into the job spec and you're looking into the different parts of the role and make sure that you're happy with them all. There might be some parts like we deal with some financial advisors who do their own paperwork, others have a support team. You know, is that noted in it? And looking and seeing kind of how that aligns with your expectations and what you want to go with. The next part is to really, sometimes with your CV, one size doesn't fit all. It's taking your time to look at your CV and making amendments to it. It's not necessarily changing the whole thing, but making amendments, especially in kind of your bullet points within kind of your role responsibilities and duties and see, oh, well, actually I have done that before. It's just not part of my day to day and making those amendments, whether you've been part of projects, whether, you know, if you worked in a target driven position before that, it might be more KPI focused. So taking these points in, you know, if you're an advisor, what did you finish um, last year as a percentage against what you um, were targeted or, you know, what products are you selling? This sort of thing, making it very use specific. So when they see that, they're like, oh, well, obviously this person knows what they're going to be doing. They'll be an easy fit. Um, if you are applying, there is so many job boards, even between LinkedIn, Indeed, Irish Jobs, applying directly with employers, applying with recruiters. Keep track of who you are applying with. Um, you know, just in case you get a call and someone says, oh, it's this person from this company. And they're like, oh, God, you know, I've applied to so many. I can't even remember at this stage. Like, that's not the best first impression to have. Mm. Also, what can happen sometimes with recruiters, they don't put the company name on the job spec. So it could happen that you might send it to myself and Holly, but you could have sent it to someone else that didn't mention the company name and your CV's put, been put in the same place twice. And once again, it's just not the best way to start off the application process mm -hmm. because it looks like you just want a job. You don't want that job. And employers, as much as you know, they want to bring someone right in, they want you to want the job as well. So it's just making sure that these things are taken into account in your job um, before you even you know send your CV. Mm -hmm. And when you do send up your CV and if there's an email attached or you get a response email and it's something that you can reply to, do follow up a couple of days later, just say, you know, I've put my CV forward, maybe add a bullet point or two, just being like, just to add to my experience in case it might have not been eye catching before, because it could be just the one time that they look and be like, oh, brilliant, actually, that's something we need. And especially if it is with the likes of a recruiter, sometimes because we're working on multiple roles at the time, that could be something else, another opportunity there for you. So when you are putting your CV in with a recruiter, it's not just going to one place. It could be multiple opportunities there for you. Mm -hmm. If you do get to the stage where you get to interview, um, it's always nice, you know, after the interview to send an email and just, you know, say thank you for their time. Even if you're not successful at that time, that interview will remember, you know, that you took the time out, you'll stand out from the other candidates and, in six months a year if another opportunity comes that is in line with your experience they'll want to contact you directly because they'll be like right we've got to go feel for them we could see them working in our organization yeah it's a really nice touch that actually yeah. do you know and I think if say if there's two you and one of the candidates do you know you kind of neck and neck and they're struggling to make a decision and then they get a little email after you after the interview to say thank you so much for your time and kind of displaying that you really want the job as well then yeah. it's definitely going to swing it in your favour. So that's really good advice. I think with regards to the interviewing part, preparation, um, I feel like a lot of these go without saying, but you know, we also do come across candidates who, who don't adhere to the obvious. So what should preparation for an interview look like? I think any research that you've done when you were applying for that position, do a little bit more, research the company and identify what it is that appeals to you about that company. Um, do you know, once you know that yourself, you're going to feel so much more confident going into the interview to really understand this is why I want to work here and this is why I want that job. Um, I'd say read through the job spec again, have a really good understanding of what the role is, what the requirements are, know your CV inside out and be able to make them links with regards to your experience and what this job is looking for. It's OK if there's gaps, do you know, but so long as you can understand both and understand how you would be a good fit that's what the interview is looking to find out um let's see I think 
Uh, one that we find definitely when we're interviewing our candidates from the from a recruitment perspective um, is not enough detail in answers. Do you know, so the fewer questions that an interviewer needs to ask, the more open you are about the experience that you have and the more detail that you can give, um, the better, basically. Do you know, so if you are in an administration role, let's just say you work with various different life companies, name the different life companies. If you work with various different products, what are, what are those products? What are you doing on a day to day? What responsibilities do you have? And go in depth, do you know. Um, then I think in terms of preparation, the competency based questions, which actually don't come up in every interview, but I, I think to be prepared for them, do you know, if you're not, you can kind of be a bit of a deer in a headlight. Um, so the, the, the competency based questions are the ones where you're ex expected to give an example based off your previous experience and discuss how you will go about solving a problem based off ex an example. Do you know, so I think to have maybe four or five examples ready to go, you know, an example where you've successfully worked in a team, an example where you've dealt with a difficult customer or a difficult situation, an example of a time where you've had to work towards targets or SLEs or KPIs. Um, they'll put, it'll put you in a really good position if you have those um, prepared and kind of in your back pocket before you go into the interview. Um, again, kind of goes without saying, but showing up on time and making sure that you're in smart dress and that goes for whether you're whether it's an in-person interview or an online interview. Um, and then I think have your own questions at the ready for the end of the end of the interview. And you know, you might already have something that you're kind of interested to ask, or there might be questions that come up through the interview conversation that by the end you're really interested to ask. But I think it's a really positive and nice touch if you end the interview and the interviewer asks if you've got any questions and you have some prepared. It just shows that you've done your research and that you are really interested and engaged in the process. Um, so I don't know, Kate, would you have, is there any questions that you would, common questions that you would maybe give advice to potential candidates to ask at the end of the interview process? Yeah, something I would always say is, look, in your current position, if you were to re-interview it again, what would you ask so you'd have a better idea of what, you know, is expected or what the company is like? So I always think ones like, you know, in three to six months, what would make me successful in this job? Like, what, where would I need to be? What kind of training would I have completed? You yeah. know, what would guarantee I'm going to pass probation? Yeah. And um, I think that's always a good one because it nearly shows that, they're showing the employer that you know I'm ready to be in this job I want to see where this can bring me um I think another one as well I think a huge like you could be so experienced but in terms of like culture and personality I think is really big with a lot of our clients as well at the moment yeah. so you know although your experience could be great if you're not fit for the team you won't be a consideration so you know I don't know if you're have if your current role has a sports and social club you're a part of is that something you can get involved in moving forward? Like what, or, you know, what's the size of the team? What's the different levels of experience on the team? Yeah. I think there's so, there's so many questions that you can have prepared and ready to go, do you know? But I think it just shows to have those questions. It shows that you are interested. And it's a perfect opportunity because, you know, yeah. as much as they want, you know, you want to work with them, you want to make sure that it's somewhere you're going to be happy, that it's you, you're obviously going to spend so many hours working with them. You want it to be a place yeah. you enjoy working. Yeah, it goes in two ways. Do you know, yeah. you want to make sure it's the right employer and the right role for you as well. Brilliant. And how do you think you would best prepare for an interview? Um, I think, I think definitely if you can, I think to develop on what I said before, you know, about doing your research into the company and um, about, maybe seeing how you're going to fit into that company, what appeals to you most about the company and the role, doing preparation around questions, knowing your CV inside out. I think if you've got someone there who you can do some preparation with, even better. As I mentioned on one of the previous slides, us as recruiters, we will also try, we will always try and put a half an hour in the diary and do interview prep with our candidates. So they're feeling as ready as possible and confident going into the interview. But even if you don't have that, you know, a partner, friend, parent, whoever it might be, um, who can ask you those questions. So you can maybe quite practice some of your answers. 
would be a really good idea. Um, and then with a particular focus, as you mentioned, on the competency-based questions, um, which generally, if you haven't prepared for, you can kind of be sometimes be caught a little bit off guard. So, Brill, and I think that brings us to the end of our slides. So thank you everyone so much. And we'll see now if there's any questions. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Holly and, and Kate. I think there was loads of information there. And I think it's great for people to maybe hear, you know, about the opportunities that are available and also maybe the hiring demands as well for APAs and QFAs. Mm -hmm. um, also, something I thought was good was, you know, a lot of people, I suppose, that are doing the QFA or working towards the QFA maybe feel that that means that they have to fit into a financial advisor role. But there's actually loads of opportunities available for people, you know, outside of the financial advisor role, which is great. Um, I, I suppose like just before we get into questions, we do have a good few questions here. Um, you know, if you do have any, you know, specific recruitment related questions, please do reach out to Holly um, or Kate, you'll see their email addresses on screen um, and they'll be able to support you and help you, you know, on your recruitment journey. And I suppose for anyone who has maybe specific questions in relation to the APA or QFA exams, you can reach out to the team um, in LIA at education at LIA.ie and they'd be more than happy to help you and support you if you do have any questions, whether that be around the exams or just even just where to where to start. We are currently enrolling for the, the term three exams, which are held in September. And um, so the final date for accepting applications will be the 19th of July. So I suppose um, just looking at some of the questions, some questions, you know, Holly and Kate, you probably have, have already answered, but there is a couple of questions in here, maybe from people around, um, you know, salary. And this came up, I know, in a, in a previous webinar that we had, um, you know, what's the entry level salary expectations? And I think you mentioned before, Holly, that, you know, it might be best for people to reach out directly about that. There's probably a lot of factors involved with that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. yeah it would it'd be just it'd be determined by the level of someone's experience like the level of qualifications and also the role so generally when we get given a role by a recruiter they will have a budget set and the budget might range let's say 30 to 35 just as an example um do you know but for someone at the upper end of that budget they're expecting an extra years of experience there may be someone at the lower end of the budget um so it can vary hugely. So I would prefer not to give a blanket answer to that question here. But anyone who does want to get a bit more information, they can definitely reach out. And I mentioned at some point there, we do have, we had a salary survey that went out um, earlier this year, which kind of gives a bit of a guide as well as to where different roles within the industry stand. Great. No, that's, that's great. Thanks, Holly. Um, and a few people asking, you know, like um, how how do they how do they register for QFA exams? So you can actually do that through the LIA website. And like I said, if you need any support, um, you can reach out to the education at LIA.ie website. Um, a question on, you know, how many modules are, are needed to obtain the QFA? So there's six modules um, in total. Um, and at the end of each module, you complete one MCQ exam. Um, we hold exams across three terms, January, May and September. So generally, students might complete one or two modules um, in a term. But I suppose the great thing about doing these exams is that you can obtain your APA um, designation en route to the QFA um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of starting point as well. Um, a couple of questions as well, and um, just around, you know, are there many opportunities for QFAs outside of Dublin? Absolutely. Like a lot of the, rec the employers we work with would have um, a nationwide presence and are growing. So yeah. we work Cork, Galway, the Midlands, Wexford. We work across the country. Obviously, Dublin is probably where a lot of them are, but then we have roles like even at the minute we're working nationwide yeah okay great like and I suppose then there's there's some more I'm just conscious of time and um, and I suppose any questions we don't get to we will follow up with people afterwards but some people saying you know they're not getting responses from employers they they have the QFA it's just something else they should be doing I know you kind of touched on this maybe during the webinar but anything yeah. else to add I think what we're experiencing is like as we we see it as well as recruiters we're really really busy um 
and the hiring managers are even busier. They're trying to recruit, but they're also trying to do their day-to-day job as well. So I'd say actually don't I think a point that Kate mentioned, like don't be afraid to follow up. Do you know, I think if you're sending across your CV in the first instance, if it's via email, do a little cover note, do you know, and just highlight your areas of experience, your qualifications, why you'd be suited for that particular role. And it's there straight away for the hiring manager or the recruiter to see. Um, follow up, um, connect with them on LinkedIn, do you know, and and hopefully that way then you'll start to get a response. Great. Thanks, Holly. Um, and just a question in around, you know, um, how long do you need to study for each exam? Um, so I suppose if someone is starting now um, and they're maybe completing exams in September. So like our, our as I said, our close off is, you know, the 19th of July. That that gives people plenty of time, you know, to to study for the exams. You're, I suppose, given a textbook, which is like your core resource. We've got a lot of online resources to support you as well. And um, the recommended, I suppose, hours of study in total um, is approximately 130 hours. So, um, you know, you've got you've got a couple of weeks, so plenty of time. We will be hosting an induction as well for students ahead of the exam term to get you started. Um, and also there are kind of exam preparation, you know, lectures and masterclasses that are held as well. So there's plenty of support available. But, um, you know, if you do need any guidance or anything, you know, please, please do reach out. We'll be more than happy to to talk to you about it. Um, I suppose I'm just like conscious of time and um, you know I think that's most of the questions answered if any question that we didn't get to you know we will be following up with everyone who attended with a link to the recording um, and also we um, will be providing the details as well for Holly and Kate in that email and um, I suppose I, I just want to say thank you so much to Holly and Kate for today's webinar. I think it's been brilliant. There's so much information there um, and I hope that everyone got a lot from it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone as well who, who joined us online this morning. We hope that you benefited from this webinar and that you enjoyed it um, and that you all have a, a lovely rest of your day. That's Great. brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.